Voilà. Ça, c'est du gaz de broussaille. Et ça, c'est de la lumière de broussaille. This isn't just a story about rotting wood. It's about a forgotten blueprint buried under decades of industrial convenience. A man once built a silent power plant in the forest, fueled not by coal or oil, but by decay. He tapped into an invisible force hiding in plain sight, and the results were almost too good to believe. Warmth in the dead of winter. Electricity without wires. Fertility in barren soil. All of it is powered by compost. And yet, most of us have never heard his name. Why did the world ignore his invention? Let's find out. The Strange Heat Beneath the Wood In the 1970s, deep in the forests of southern France, a forester named Jean Pen noticed something strange. He had piled up chipped wood, not for firewood, but simply to store it. And days later, it was hot. Not warm, hot. It didn't make sense. There was no engine, no sunlight, no spark. Yet the wood pile was radiating heat like a slow burning fire. Curious, he started watching closely. Each time he soaked the brush wood and left it to rot, it heated up again and again. What he stumbled upon wasn't magic. It was biology. A hidden process that had always been there, just ignored. Microbes were feasting on the dead wood in a natural process called aerobic decomposition. As they broke it down, they released energy, energy that could be felt, measured, and maybe even harnessed. That's when the idea struck. What if this wasn't just a quirk of nature? What if it was the key to something much bigger? Gene didn't have funding. He wasn't a scientist or an engineer, but he was stubborn, curious, and deeply connected to the land. And in that pile of rotting brush, he saw more than heat. He saw potential, the kind that could power a home, maybe even change the world. A forest, a law, and an unexpected opportunity. Jean Pen wasn't chasing headlines. He was just trying to live simply and sustainably with his wife in the dry, rugged hills of southern France. Managing a 590-acre forest on a tight budget, Jean found clever ways to make do with what he had. One of his first discoveries came out of necessity. He couldn't afford straw bedding for his goats, so he turned to the brushwood scattered across his land. He chipped it into small pieces and used it instead. Not only did it work, it worked better. The goats stayed healthier, and their waste, mixed with wood chips, created compost that transformed his barren soil into rich, living earth. Soon, his vegetable patch was thriving. Giant watermelons, towering tomato plants, and even tropical crops like chayote grew in dry, sandy dolomite without any irrigation. The compost retained water, fed the roots, and brought life back to land that wasn't supposed to produce much of anything. Then came a turning point. The French government passed new wildfire prevention laws requiring forest breaks. Jean suddenly had more brushwood than he knew what to do with. Most would have burned it or hauled it away. Jean chipped it, soaked it, and watched it decompose. That's when the heat came, and with it, an idea that would change his life. It wasn't just about solving one problem anymore. The forest was handing him something unexpected. Fuel. Energy. A self-sustaining loop that nature had always offered, but few had ever noticed. Jean was about to build something no one saw coming. Building the Biomealer. Jean Payne didn't stop at observation. He wanted to control the heat, to turn it into something useful. That's when the Biomealer was born, a compost-powered heating system built not with machines, but with patience, precision, and piles of wood chips. At first, 
it was just a rough rectangular heap. But over time, Jean discovered that shaping the pile into a dense circular mound improved heat retention and accelerated decomposition. The design wasn't just about structure, it was about efficiency. Inside this giant compost reactor, Jean packed 40 tons of chipped brushwood. Coiled through it was 650 feet of polyethylene pipe. He pumped cold groundwater through the pipe, and when it emerged from the other side, it was hot, around 140 degrees. It delivered this heat consistently, day and night, no matter the weather. With this, Gene was able to heat his 1,000-square-foot home and supply hot tap water for up to 18 months without burning a single log or using any external energy source. But Gene wasn't finished. In the center of the pile, he placed a sealed steel tank filled with water-soaked brushwood. As it decomposed, it released methane, which he captured in old truck inner tubes, that gas-powered stoves, a generator, and even his car. What Gene had created wasn't a compost pile. It was a living machine, silent, slow, and remarkably powerful. A system fueled by decay, but driven by vision. A natural reactor that gave back far more than it took, powering a life off-grid. John Payne wasn't experimenting anymore, he was living it. His system didn't just heat water or grow vegetables, it powered an entire lifestyle, completely off-grid. The methane collected from the compost pile was enough to run his oven and gas stove for a full year. With a modest generator, he converted the remaining gas into electricity. It wasn't much, just 100 watts, but it was enough to charge a battery bank, light up their five-bedroom home, and keep essential appliances running. Even transportation wasn't left out. Gene modified his car to run on compressed methane stored in two roof-mounted cylinders. It wasn't flashy, but it gave him about 60 miles of clean, renewable fuel. From cooking and bathing to driving and lighting his home, every part of Gene's life was powered by a pile of rotting wood. And when the heat finally faded and the energy slowed, nothing was wasted. He scooped up the decomposed wood chips, now rich, dark compost, and spread them over his land. They became food for the soil, starting the cycle all over again. Gene had built more than a machine. He'd built a closed-loop system, one that created energy, restored the earth, and asked for nothing in return. The world takes notice then forgets. Jean Payne's invention didn't go unnoticed. Journalists, scientists, and energy experts traveled from around the world to see the Biomealer in action. Reader's Digest featured him in 1981. His book sold over 100,000 copies. For a while, it looked like his method might spread. Compost heat systems, methane generators, sustainable forestry practices. One energy journalist even called it the future of fertilizer and energy production. And yet, it faded, slowly, quietly. The reasons weren't technical. The system worked. It was clean, reliable, and regenerative. But it demanded effort. You needed space, ideally a hectare of forest. You needed tools to chip wood, time to soak it, and patience to wait for the heat to build. It wasn't as simple as flipping a switch. Governments didn't push it. Companies couldn't profit from it. Unlike solar or wind, there was no billion-dollar industry behind compost heat. No factories, no supply chains, just one man, some land, and a pile of sticks. Gene had offered the world a radical alternative, an energy model that was small, local, and circular. But we were moving fast in another direction. One built on convenience, scale, and profit. And Gene's quiet forest power plant was left behind. The missed opportunity. Today, we are surrounded by conversations about energy, how to make it cleaner, 
cheaper, and more sustainable. And yet, one of the most practical solutions was already tested half a century ago by a man with no lab, no funding, and no corporate agenda. Jean Payne's Biomiler created renewable heat, electricity, fuel, and fertilizer, all from waste wood. No emissions, no mining, and no pollution. Just nature, doing what it's always done. But instead of scaling it, we chose systems that required factories, fossil fuels, and massive infrastructure. We bet on centralized energy grids and global supply chains. And now, as wildfires grow worse, fertilizer prices skyrocket, and energy bills rise, Gene's system seems more relevant than ever. It wasn't just an energy source. It was a wildfire buffer, a soil restorer, a blueprint for self-sufficiency. Sure, it's not easy. You can't buy a biomealer off the shelf. It takes work, space, and commitment. But in return, you get freedom, independence, and a connection to your environment that no power bill can give you. So why aren't we using it today? Maybe because the solution was never meant to be mass-produced. It was meant to be rebuilt. One determined person at a time. A system with no waste. What made John Payne's creation so remarkable wasn't just that it worked. It was how completely it worked. Every part of his system served multiple functions. The wood chips provided heat, then fuel, and finally turned into nutrient-rich compost. The methane-powered stoves and lights then burned clean, leaving no toxic residue. Even the act of clearing brushwood helped reduce wildfire risk in the forest. Nothing was wasted, nothing polluted. It was a circular system, something modern industries still struggle to achieve. Instead of extracting energy from deep underground or building machines that need rare minerals and constant maintenance, Gene used what the forest gave freely. Dead branches, twigs, waste. And in return, he got life, energy, food, safety. This wasn't just about sustainability. It was about regeneration. The land wasn't being used it was being healed. The soil grew richer. The forest became safer. And Gene's life became freer. In a time when our solutions often create new problems, plastic waste from solar panels, mining damage from batteries, Gene's biomealer stands apart. It gives more than it takes. Maybe that's the lesson. Maybe true innovation doesn't look like a breakthrough. Maybe it looks like a compost pile, quietly doing the impossible. Jean Payne didn't invent some futuristic machine. He simply listened to nature and followed its logic. His system wasn't flashy, profitable, or easy. But it worked, and it still does. In a world scrambling for clean energy and soil that can feed us, his forgotten experiment feels like a roadmap we chose to ignore. Maybe it's not about scaling up. Maybe it's about scaling back, returning to systems that give more than they take. His legacy isn't a blueprint for corporations. It's a quiet challenge for individuals. So the real question is, what would you build if you had nothing but time and wood?